which is a uh, mobile app for businesses to streamline workflow processes. And so essentially with the vision of many other co-working spaces, um, the idea is you know, not only to defray real estate costs by partnering with other uh, small businesses, but also create in a really interesting work environment where if you cur curate in the right companies, you can have you know, a very dynamic um, collaborative atmosphere where people are at different stages of the startup process and uh, they can you know, learn from one another. And it just so happens that in this area, in Northern Virginia, we tend to skew a little bit older, but that, that can be a good thing because a lot of the entrepreneurs have started a company before or they, um, you know, they've worked in the corporate world, so they, they bring a lot of expertise that you might not necessarily find uh, at, at every co-working space or in every, in every region or sub-region in the area. Um, I'm very excited about tonight's event. Uh, obviously, we have some great panelists, if you would all thank Jonathan Aberman, Casey Berman, and Tom Weithman. This event represents uh, pretty much what we hope to achieve when it comes to the programming for startups to not only get access to investors, who many of you have showed up, not just the panelists, but to, to meet these companies and uh, offer advice and um, ultimately invest in many cases. But um, yeah, essentially, this type of programming, along with an event we're having in January, which is basically um, discussing the balance between cost of acquisition versus making com company cash flow positive. So you know, how much um, equity do you um, offer for investors versus how much do you keep in house, and and really, how do you manage uh, your growth? Do you want to, you know, just eke out small percentage growth, or do you want to? try for hyper growth by taking greater equity stake and you know, ramping up your cost of acquisition for customers. So um, just a, a few notes about Refraction right now. We have 48 companies, five nonprofits. Uh, the nonprofits are here because we believe that empathy is the currency of innovation. And basically what that means is if you can have an empathetic company culture, you can not only better serve your internal team, but you can better understand your clients and you can better uh, attract and retain talent. So we really try to broaden people's uh, gaze when they you know, come in here to not just look at themselves and their own company and companies like them, uh, which is helpful, but to you know, see the broader community as well and you know, ultimately see greater addressable markets and what have you. There are many, many things that come out of those learnings. So without further ado about Refraction, I'll be happy to discuss a few more events that we have coming up in the near future. Actually, tomorrow we're having a lunch and learn called Hack uh, Success with Edge of Yesterday. That's a really interesting, um, almost um, Leonardo-ian, if I can say that, uh, way of approaching being an entrepreneur. So looking at people like Leonardo da Vinci, who had, um, he was a polymath, you know, he had many different skills and essentially bringing that to your work life. We also have a happy hour tomorrow, tomorrow night, so something a little less heady, but should still be fun. Next, uh, on Friday actually, another Lunch and Learn uh, that we're very excited about with a, a similar theme but a, a different take on it and you can find more information about these events on our website, refractionpoint.org as you see, slash events. And next week we're very excited to announce the Innovation Discourse which basically will bring together some of the top thinkers in innovation in the region. and. Um, provide a forum for, for entrepreneurs and many other uh, luminaries to get together and, and discuss how they can work together and create something that's uh, very synergistic. So that, that's actually gonna be at George Mason University and you can find more details as well on the website. And lastly, uh, in a couple of weeks, we're having Startup Grinds Holiday Party here, so another fun event. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased to, as I said, welcome these panelists. They have very storied careers, so I will only give the briefer of introductions for each of them, but um, know that this only represents yeah, a fraction of what they've accomplished. So our first, yeah, a fraction of a fraction. Um, the first one I'd like to welcome up, and he'll just say a few words about himself and his group, is Jonathan Aberman. Jonathan is a highly respected and valued thought leader on entrepreneurship and innovation. His work as a venture investor, innovation consultant, university professor, and media commentator allows him to experience, connect, 
and connect the many threads of entrepreneurship and technolo technology innovation that are core to the United States economy and its future. When Jonathan talks about these areas, the community takes notice. He is identified as a leader of change and influence in print and television media, among other things, being recognized by Washingtonian Magazine as a tech titan, by Washington Business Journal as a member of the Power 100, and by the Commonwealth of Virginia as one of the 50 most influential entrepreneurs in the Commonwealth. He started Amplifier Ventures in 2004 to help entrepreneurs launch technology businesses and has since seeded 16 startup technology businesses in internet, nanotechnology, any energy conservation, mobile, and cybersecurity sectors. An affiliated consulting business amplifier advisors followed in 2009 to allow Jonathan to apply his expertise to entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial approaches to innovation, creation, and commercialization, working for a wide array of government, for-profit, and non-profit ventures. In 2012, he launched Founders Corps, a not-for-profit corporation promoting technology mentorship and regional economic development. In 2013, he formed Tandem NSI, uh, a public-private partnership that has created a large and growing community of entrepreneurs and national security agencies to address advanced technology challenges of uh, national importance. Um, Jonathan is a sought-after commentator on developments in technology innovation and political economics. He is a weekly he has a weekly column in the Washington Post and is often quoted in the Washington Business Journal, the Huffington Post, and the New York Times. Uh, he hosts a forward-thinking radio forward-thinking radio on Sirius XM and is a regular on on-air contributions to Federal News Radio. And Jonathan is also a, the lead guitarist of Two Car Living Room and an avid reader of science fiction. So if you would please welcome Jonathan Averman. Thank you. So, yeah, right? I mean, holy crap, when I wrote that for the website, I never thought anybody would read it in front of me. God. I mean, that was only two-thirds of it, by the way. Yeah, oh, wow. I paid to consult a lot of money for that content. Holy crap, I don't know what to say after that. Thank God I know a lot of you, otherwise I'd be dead. And Randy is a Friday when they, you know, he's known me long to me. If I say anything out of line, the hook's going to come out. Um, so... What do you do after that? It's like following the elephant act in the circus, right? Anyway, so look, uh, I'm I'm really happy to, to be in this in this particular space. It, I think this is really cool. By the way, you talk about tending older. I, somebody pointed out to me today the average age of a Facebook employee. Maybe somebody saw it on Facebook today. I'm two. And, yeah, I'm I'm like two and a half times older than the average Facebook employee. So, but I'm still hanging in tech. And and uh, actually, I think that that's really important to note. Maybe as a, as a springing off point, which is. The great thing about entrepreneurship and innovation is, is that it really does keep you engaged and keep you fresh, you know? And, and I think that one of the things that is our biggest opportunity in this region is that we have a lot of people that are involved in innovation, um, that are in a position to take a, a, you know, a second act in their lives or retool their careers or go different directions. And that type of behavior is much more acceptable here in other parts of the country. And, uh, and I think that, in fact, that's, our, that's one of our secrets, that's one of our secrets to success, is you know, you'll hear that there's an unbelievable talent base here, right? But a lot of us spend times in and out of government, we spend times in large companies, starting small companies. That's, I think, one of the big distinguishing characteristics of our region. But you have to have places where people can come and infect each other with entrepreneurship, right? As you guys know, entrepreneurship is not a single combat activity. Right? I mean, that, that's downhill skiing, you know, you, you know, that's being on the, the bad slopes and not knowing what you're doing. Entrepreneurship is, is a full contact sport, but it's a collegial and coll collaborative behavior, I believe. And you have to have places where serendipity can occur. So, you know, I know James uh, Quigley, but God, I know when he got, his, got Canvas started, it was just this crazy idea. I mean, who, who would even think that the idea of doing apps on a, on a, a phone, I mean, he, his first prototype he showed me was on a Blackboard. <laughs> it's like, who the hell would want to do this? Blackberry, you know? But it just goes to show how, you know, somebody who's really interested in entrepreneurship can really be committed to it and, and build something. And it's really, it's just a pleasure to be here. And so uh, I look forward to providing some comments and, and hopefully I can provide you guys with some useful insights. So thanks for having me.
And thanks, uh, I guess, for reading this <laughs> By the way, I see a lot of you in the back. There's some more seats around the corner that you might not be able to see, so feel free to venture up. We're, we're not going to bite. Um, the, uh, our next angel on the panel that I'm pleased to welcome is Casey Berman. As president of operations for Berman Enterprises, Casey is responsible for all of the operations in the company's real estate portfolio, HR decisions, leasing plan, and maintaining tenant relationships. As managing director of Camber Creek, Casey manages deal flow, due diligence, investment, management decisions, strategic assistance, and startup companies where Berman Enterprise real estate experience, expertise, and assets offer significant value. And a little bit about Camber Creek. Uh, it is a corporate venture arm of the Berman Enterprises, a real estate development firm that owns and manages over 9 million square feet of office, retail, and multifamily properties. Camber Creek. Uh, leverages 60 years of real estate experience and entrepreneurial spirit to help passionate people with great ideas develop valuable products and solutions. In addition to financial investment, uh, they utilize experience and access to industry partners and collaborative, their collaborative spirit to contribute to the success of their company. So uh, thank you for helping me to welcome Casey Berman to the stage. Um, it's great to see everybody out here. Thank you, Canvas and the Refraction Group. We uh, were actually an early investor in that BlackBerry app that, uh, <laughs> that was a great Jim uh, showed us. We were a user of that same software. And one of the interesting things we've come to learn through both angel investing, venture investing, and operating a real estate company is the most important thing is the process. We see a lot of people, it's like, uh, they see the conclusion. You know, you see the Facebook going public, you see uh, YouTube, you see all these amazing companies, you see, on, I don't know if you guys look at Crunchbase, but on Crunchbase, all these fundings, every single day, there's 10 fundings. Those are the outliers. You know, the people in this room, the people in rooms all over the country like this, working really hard day in, day out, on the process of starting something new, working towards their dream, that is the norm. So the important thing that you know we see and we, we want to convey to, or I want to convey tonight is that it's all about the hard work in between those listings. So that one day where your name is in Crunchbase, that's the most important part. And as an investor, it's amazing to work with people like you guys on the process, the day in, day out, trying to help you achieve that longer term vision. So you know, thank you for being here and uh, you know, we look forward to hearing some pitches. Thank you, Casey. Our last uh, panelist, but certainly not least, is Tom Weithman. Yeah, okay. This is gonna be uh, brief, even though Tom also has a very storied career, Casey and Jonathan as well, but I tried to cut it down. Yeah, I see your skull in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, I'll have the, I'll have the uh, paperback version of this printed as well. You can get a copy of that. <laughs> Tom serves as a as the managing director of CIT Gap Funds and investment and chief investment officer of Mach 37 Cyber Accelerator. Through CIT Gap Funds, a family of seed and early stage venture funds making investments in Virginia's most promising tech, life sciences, and clean tech companies. Weithman's team has invested more than $18 million in more than 150 startups, attracting more than $400 million of private funding into portfolio companies, driving multiple companies to downstream venture and angel financing and several portfolio company exits. So that's uh, as brief as I'm gonna go. So here's Tom, thank you. I don't know who writes this stuff. Jonathan, you'll appreciate it. You know, I get to travel all over Virginia with what I do. We don't invest just here, we invest all over the Commonwealth. And I was down in Blacksburg one time, and someone introduced me as an iconic figure. Iconic figure. Which, which is great, and so you stop and think about it, and people portraying icons are usually wooden and dead. So, <laughs> they're not a taker. But uh, delighted to be here tonight. You know, Nick reminded me we invested in Canvas. I think three offices and two co-working spaces ago. I remember sitting in that little office out uh, by Lake Ann with, with, uh, uh, with, with Jim going over the numbers uh, quite, quite some time ago. 
And, and but Canvas is just one story in our portfolio. Obviously, we've, we've gotten the opportunity to do a lot of investments all over the Commonwealth. Um, and we've been at it for about 12 years with the Gap Fund, hard to believe. And, and with much of the same core team doing it, which is a source of, of great pride and, and pleasure for me. But, but the fun of it all is the sheer variety, uh, which usually devolves to the people involved. We've come in contact with some great folks over the years with some fantastic ideas uh, you know, in Northern Virginia and elsewhere, and in tech, in life science, and in clean tech. And these last three years with the Mach 37 Accelerator have been no exception. Some great ideas and have been able to develop a little bit of focus in one particular area. You know, I'm, I was really, really thrilled that you called attention to the fact that we skew a little bit older here in our entrepreneurial community. You put me on a couch over there like that the other day, and my wife knows what happens. If, uh, Casey can nudge me in a couple minutes, I'll try to stay awake and lucid for the presentations. But thanks so much for the opportunity to be here, and really look forward to hearing everybody pitch. That's great. Thank you so much, John. Well, we'll jump right into it. We're not going to waste much time with uh, any more formalities. We're gonna go alphabetical. I hope that works for everyone. Our first, and if it doesn't, if somebody's not here, we can always put it at the end. Um, or, or tough, yeah, I like Jonathan's answer. Uh, Anroom Technologies, are you here? I haven't seen you yet. Ah, there you are, I'm sorry. Let's uh, welcome Anroom Technologies. And this is a four minute pitch, and we're, we're gonna be followed by six minutes of Q&A from, um, from the investors, so take it away. Um, so I appreciate everyone coming out this evening, appreciate the opportunity to uh, tell, tell you all a little about Drive and uh, hopefully not put anyone to sleep. <laughs> These so, sofas are really comfortable. So I have to work hard then. Huh? <laughs> so uh, I, let's get started. So um, let's start with a problem. So right now, uh, dealerships and service centers uh, for the automotive space really have no way of knowing when their customers need automotive service. Um, there's some newer cars with the OEMs that are doing some things, but the, uh, the big market there, really, nobody knows. You rely on your customer's intuition to bring vehicles in for service. And I don't know if anybody does sales here, but you don't really want to rely on your customer's intuition. Um, right now, you've got mailers, you've got flyers, uh, you probably, everybody's received, hey, you probably have your 12,000 mile oil change that you need. You've received that flyer when you've had 10,000 miles since your oil change, you throw it away, you have no idea what it means. You don't care because it's not really applicable to what's going on. Um, service centers then also especially have the problem with customer retention. Um, if I go to Jiffy Lube or something like that, um, next time I need an oil change or check engine light comes on, I see the first place that I'm driving past and, and drop the car off. Um, and then if we actually get into uh, looking at that customer retention, uh, national average, that uh, opportunity cost for that single vehicle um, is about 913 bucks a year. So if you're, if you're losing those customers, uh, just going to another, if there's attrition in your customer base, going to a, another provider, uh, you've got some decent opportunity that's being lost. So the solution, the solution that, uh, that Drive presents is getting customers directly in contact with the service provider based upon actual needs. So what Drive does, Drive collects, um, Drive actually collects leads or generates leads based on actual maintenance needs. Not projected maintenance needs, not uh, estimates on maintenance needs, but actual maintenance needs. We connect in the car, we know when you've hit your 5,000 miles for your next oil change, we know when your check engine light went off, whatever it may be, we know when your alternator is dead, but the car is still running. Um, we get that information back to the dealership or service center that you've worked with, and we also get that to you. Yeah, your check engine light might come on in the car, but uh, now it's also coming on your app. Um, this all can happen in real time. We get, the, like I said, we get the customers in touch with the service providers, and now the service providers have the opportunity to reach out to the customer with an actual lead. It's not a cold call in a sense. It's an actual lead, it's a known problem, and they can uh, bring that customer in to be monetized. Think about it, you're driving down the road, um, check engine light goes off, you're not paying attention to it, you don't really care, you kind of put it out of your mind. <coughs> then your service, then your uh, dealership calls you and says, hey, we saw your check engine light went off, we could schedule you for an appointment tomorrow at three. Odds are you're gonna take it. Um, but whereas you might not have been so exercised to do so previously. One minute? Oh my goodness, man. All right, so uh, I had a video there, we'll skip that. So um, 
Let's actually skip. Uh, <clears throat> so we're looking at about 250 million cars in the U.S. and uh, we're looking at we look at an estimate of about 200 two, two and a half percent market share. Of what we think we could uh, what we could do here. It's about six million cars. Um, trying to capture about 25 percent of the cars in any service center, um, which I would need we need to capture about 10 percent of that service center market base. So the numbers numbers are not uh, the numbers are not too bad, and they look pretty good from from this perspective. Um, we've got some competitors out there. You guys might have heard of Hum from Verizon, Zuby, et cetera. Um, but one of the problems that you'll have with these guys is that the cost, especially dealing with the data transport, data needs to go from the phone, from the car, to the service center. We've solved that problem a different way. Love to talk to you about that. And that's it, actually. So I guess we ran out a little time there, but um, I'll answer some questions, hopefully uh, answer answer questions you guys may have. Yeah, we have six minutes for Q&A from the panel, and if you guys run out of questions, which I doubt you will, you're welcome to open it up to the audience. What's the business model? So the business model is a is a business to business <laughs> service directly with the uh, with the dealership or the service center. So basically, we're driving we're generating leads for actual maintenance needs that they can monetize. We drive those customers back to the business. Uh, to the service center, and obviously then we're monetizing from the service center. The whole service is provided free to the end customer. Uh, really, this is something that customers really are not interested in paying for. Drivers are not interested in paying for this stuff. Hum is a perfect example of this. People don't want to pay for it. Um, but in this case, the service center uh, is able to be monetized from the service center to business business relationship. They're increasing the revenue, direct ROI. We capitalize on that. Well, I wouldn't necessarily conclude so far that that Customers won't pay for the service. They're different. They're different services. And for example, I have an Infinity which has Boom Touch, mm -hmm. that's uh, very useful. So there are various ways that the manufacturers are going to pull this data. What I'm interested in is so first of all, I, I agree with your assumptions. I think this is a big business opportunity. Uh, I know that that dealerships make their money on maintenance. They don't make most of the cars these days, and that's even going to be more so as Tesla blows up uh, the end of the auto industry. What is your solution? I mean, what, what technologically, what is your solution? Is it a dongle? Is it, it how are you interacting with the car and providing the information to so, trigger that service? Call? So from a technical standpoint, we are a software as a service. We collect the data actually from a dongle that's installed in the car. But uh, what really differentiates us from some of the other providers that are out there, um, all, most of the other providers that you see here are gonna be cellular based. Right. So you have relatively expensive cellular subscription costs that have to be borne by these service providers, paying to Verizon or AT&T or whomever that may be. So we've, we've actually got an in-house developed solution for a seamless data transport through user cell phones. Basically, the assumption is that somebody's going to be in that car with a cell phone that's an iPhone or an Android at some point in time, and we're going to move the data through that phone without the user having to interact with an application or with our service. So we have no transport costs. So it's Bluetooth, not basically yes. Bluetooth. The phone. How much does it cost to make the uh, to make the unit? The unit, um, we have uh, about twenty five dollars for the unit right now, and we can you know go offshore and stuff. But uh, it's uh, it's a decent price. Can you get GPS on it also? We'll save the uh, questions actually after the panel. So can you tell us more about your traction? And what have you done? Where are you at today? So we've, we've got some customers, we've done some demos, we've got some trials going with some customers, uh, mostly on the East Coast, and um, is a, the response is uh, generally very positive. Obviously, it comes down to ROI, you know, we're still in that time where we're trying to prove the ROI. I can't go to a new customer now and say, hey, I've got two years of track record, and here's the customers that I've got, and they have a 20% increase in revenue and stuff. I can't, I can't show that now. So we're still, uh, you know, still working conceptually with customers. But there, there's definitely a number of customers out there that we've talked to that um, believe in the concept. So we're working through the... Uh, the good news is, is that I would think if you went to a company like she I mean, the good news is the auto, you know, the, the, um, the dealerships are consolidating so rapidly. You go to a Sonic or a she mm -hmm. or one of these companies, you know, you, you can end up... They have, uh, I'd be really interested, I'm sure you're more interested than I will ever be, uh, this seems to me to be one of those things where if I'm trying to if I'm trying to connect people to my dealership and I want to get them coming back so I can sell the services where I make the money, 
spending 25 bucks or 50 bucks or 100 bucks on a dongle that goes in the car that's branded with my logo. That doesn't seem like a crazy sale to me. How long have you been trying to do this? So, I mean, we really conceptualized this about two years ago. Uh, it's taken, uh, you know, working through, working through the business model and uh, working on the engineering side uh, for implementation for, for about a year. So. So you've been trying to sell it for a year already, or you've been how how long? No yeah, bullshit. Have I really been trying to sell this thing so far? Uh, quarter or two. Okay. Yesterday. Yesterday. <laughs> Yesterday. <laughs> Yesterday. <laughs> and how does this work if, if the driver wants to go to multiple service centers? So really, the idea is that that they're not going to be you're, from the service center standpoint. You're you're trying not to have them go to multiple service centers. You're trying to have them always directed back to you. So when there's a maintenance problem and they're driving by Jiffy Loop, you're calling them because you know about it. You might be Midas or whatever. You're calling them because you know about it. Right. They don't get the opportunity to go to Jiffy Loop. You're trying to get them back in. Right. So it's about it's about uh, customer retention. Have you talked to any of the big dealerships? Have you talked to uh, she or any, any of the yeah, big we've, names? We've had some good conversations with some, some bigger dealerships, but also some bigger service centers. The service centers is actually a very interesting market because some of the dealerships are like, hey, you've got this Infinity thing or you got this Benz thing, but the service centers will never have access to that proprietary OEM levels of information. Yeah. So they're, they're paranoid as all get out. Uh, so they seem to be, right now, we're seeing them as this very much one of the hottest markets that we can be playing in because they want to be able to play in the same space that OEMs are, or the OEM level services are, are playing in that they'll never get access to. Can you tell us more about the team? So, so um, I have the C Jason Harris, the CEO. I'm sorry I didn't introduce myself there. Um, and I've got uh, Frank DeAngelis, uh, one of our advisors with us. Um, the Anarim Technologies team actually has a uh, expertise in consulting and services. Um, we've, uh, like I said, a couple years ago said, wait a second, this connected car space is very interesting. Spent some time understanding the business model and starting to to look at uh, what opportunities may be there. And from a strategic standpoint, we decided that this was a very good place to play. So we've taken our technical expertise uh, to actually roll the product and um, putting a team together to accelerate its rollout as well. One more minute. So if you guys don't have any questions, we can... Well, where are you with Fundry? So as I said, uh, Amp Technologies is a services company, and uh, we've, we've done this all internally. Um, it's a strategic goal. Um, certainly not the cheapest thing in the world to do, but uh, I think we're, we're doing very well to get it to the point where we've gotten in that. Um, but certainly appreciate that as we're looking to grow this nationally or, or even beyond the national sphere, uh, there is a level where we're going to have to seek some outside investment to. So you're going to are, yeah. are you going to spin it off into a new co and take the money in the new co, or are you going to want for somebody to invest in the service company? Really doesn't matter. It'll matter to the investor. Right, <laughs> but we, you know, we have the conversations yeah. and can figure that out. At this point, it's a, you know, it's a question of what's there in technology and what's out of this conversation. Yeah, get ready. Great, and that is time. Well, thank you very much for thank you. Thank you. We'll increase it to uh, seven minutes. We're going to do six minutes, but we've made up some time there thanks to Jonathan and everyone else's comments about the intro. So. By the way, how can everyone hear us in the back? Is it good when everyone's speaking far away from the mic? Is it still here? Fine, yeah. Okay, great. Um, and, uh, by the way, there's still some more seats up here and here, so if you wouldn't mind, people just scoot in one seat, make some more room. Let's make our uh, fellow guests comfortable. Thank you. Don't be shy, come on up. The next company uh, I'm excited to introduce is NFBI. Please welcome the FBI. NFDA is a modern BI platform that provides a bot interface to your, to your application data and business intelligence. Let me explain before uh, what's the problem that we're trying to solve here. I'm going to make a bold statement here. <laughs> die dashboards die. 
Yes. I know we all love the dashboards, right? No. Let me explain now uh, what I mean by this actually. So this is a great dashboard with a bunch of uh, charts there, a lot of data points here. But there's some fundamental problem with these dashboards here. <laughs> so you're often lost, like, okay, what is this dashboard telling me? Rather than asking the question that you're trying to solve for your business, you're looking at the dashboard and trying to understand what answers can I get from this dashboard. It's exactly the counterintuitive. And it's very rigid. It tries to answer the, your questions in a certain format, and it's very hard for you to get the answers that you exactly need. It works very good for kind of for descriptive analytics, like telling you what really happened actually. But think, let me give you a quick example. Like uh, we all love Google, right? When it tells you like, hey, you're late for the meeting, you should get started. It's going to start in 30 minutes. That's a very small, concise message that you're getting here, and you can act upon that. Figure out if I tell you the same thing, go and check out a dashboard so that it, you can get the commute time and figure out when to start. So our solution is uh, pretty much starts with the co providing a very conversational interface that you can embed right within the applications actually. And we want to go beyond just telling what happened, move into more of the predictive analytics and practically push the data insights. We also provide a BI stack, but I'm not going to go into the specifics into this uh, uh, presentation here. And uh, this is how you use our conversational interface, actually. You can add this, uh, the bot icon anywhere in your application on any screen that you want, and the user taps onto that. You can, the user can quickly start typing the business questions that he's trying to figure it out, actually. Hey, what is my sales last month? Hey, what is the, uh, the, what is the customer's, uh, uh, what, what is the, how long has this customer been with me? Like, immediately the bot will respond with the corresponding data and any visualizations that are related to that. And it's not just looking at the data here, you will be within the application itself, you'll be able to drill down further into the data and extract any uh, trends that you want. And the moment, let's say there's a spike here, the fear of the number, you can immediately start a conversation within the bar itself so that you can collaborate back with the team. None of the data insights are lost and you're really behaving as a true data-driven data, data company. So let's say you asked a very complex question, actually, and the bot couldn't figure it out. What it will prompt you is like go and uh, create a separate uh, follow-up ticket for that so that none of these questions are lost here and pe other people can vote for it. And once your data team works for an answer for that and provides you the answer, you'll be immediately notified. Uh, the exciting part of that is it's like not just about the descriptive sort of analytics, we are moving more towards the product. So let's say uh, the bot is kind of monitoring the data for you. You keep performing metrics that you can define here. And whenever you see some trend over here, it will prompt you, hey, there's a 10% spike in your sales here. So you can immediately again annotate that and share it with your team to follow if it's a good or bad. Uh, so how it works, we have a BI stack that kind of works with all the data sources that you have. The bot kind of stands on the top, the top of that. And uh, the bot is what powers this, uh, the interface that I just showed you. And also we're working towards uh, providing the interface so, uh, so that you can interact naturally uh, via the voice using Alex and like, hey, tell me the top 10 customers like that. Uh, so there's a huge opportunity, let me skip this slide. Uh, so where we are, we, ha we have the core BI platform in place to connect the data, query it, visualize it and all. And we have some paying customers uh, already we have, and we have a bunch of uh, pilots going on right now. Uh, we're releasing the beta version of the bot in, uh, within a few weeks and that's what we're really uh, excited about. So it's a subscription model and available on all the major uh, we have for it. this time, but again, we have seven minutes of Q&A from the panel, so fire away. Thank you. So can you tell us more <coughs> about the problem that it actually solves? So my primitive understanding is the dashboard presents data, like simple data to me where I can, in a clear, concise place, see data is, what is the bot, what problem is this bot solving with that presentation of a dashboard is not the sure. presentation? Yeah, so the best problem of the dashboard is right, you have the data there and you were kind of uh, uh, dumped all the data in front of you and you have to make interpretation of the data and then make decisions. So what we're trying to reverse is like, everything starts with the business question. Hey, how am I doing with my sales perspective? Or is there a spike in my sales? Or how is the sentiment with this particular customer? You might be just fetching the data from one sales or multiple sources. But it's all curated and nicely presented in a format so that you can easily consume. So you, you're kind of interacting with your data in a natural format rather than just looking at uh, the dashboards, which are awesome from a data scientist perspective or like somebody who is really familiar with each and every attribute of the data, basically. But when you skew these dashboards, we often see that, like, I mean, uh, the business users are often lost and then they kind of stop using these. I mean, it looks very pretty in the past and then nobody really goes to them and extracts the insights from them. So, 
I, I hear what you're saying, but in the example, you pulled a graph from the equivalent of a dashboard. So it's like you went back to one graph. I guess I don't understand how the actual product is the, the example of the product I really want to understand how it's different than the actual dashboard but it's almost it seems like it's adding a step to getting to that in, that graph from the dashboard so uh, this is what all you need to plug into your application to interact with the, your data with our solution I was just showing the first slide as an example like a, how the traditional solutions kind of so it's a, it's a replacement to a exactly dashboard. exactly yeah. sorry probably I was rushing yeah. too much it's kind of more of instead of having a dashboard exactly yeah. So you have this bot at your fingertips. At any time, you can start interacting with and get the insights that you want. Got it. I mean, it, it's, why aren't you postulating that if I'm an analyst, I may have I may have 20 tabs open. You know, I, mean, I may have all these different analytic tools going, and you're telling me that that you can through your your search. Uh, algorithm, or your, you know, that, that you will be able to reduce my natural language search to the output from one of the various analytic tools that I have running. Exactly. Right. Are you also doing a data mashup where you will cut cross databases and and do that? So yeah. So how do you do that? So uh, I mean, we're not just uh, giving this as a black box, like which will answer all every question that you put in natural format. So you still need to connect your data curate the content and create and format it and all. What we are providing essentially a nice interface for your business users so that they can naturally interact with that and then get the answers they need actually. So you're not using you're not using machine learning to to uh, make associations between we are. Them. you are? Yep, yep. So, so if I've got if I'm if I'm tracking my, my in inventory turns over here and I'm tracking my employee utilization over here in two distinct databases you can pull that across into a single report? Exactly, so the way it works is like you can pull the data together and then tell like the, using our machine learning models, like start monitoring those metrics basically. Mm -hmm. And then once you, if you see any patterns or any kind of off, off uh, balance with those kind of numbers that you have, it alerts you. But like you understand what I'm saying, right? That all these analytic tools basically are walled gardens. Exactly. Right, and so what I'm asking you is, I think the, the yeah, voice statement stuff's so. great, even though I hate Siri, I hope she dies. <laughs> um, I mean, seriously, you, you know, if you want to hate the Department of Defense, the Department of Defense funded Siri. Or if you like Siri, thank DOD. But either way, it's DOD's fault. Sure, sure. Uh, but, but what I'm getting at is, is that putting aside the, the, the voice interaction, which is, is interesting enough, but what I am interested in is how much are you actually able to take all this freaking data, that's in wall gardens because each of these vendors wants to wall gardens in their various way. How how are you type, how are you integrated in it into you know how are you integrated? Sure, sure. So essentially, the bot is basically the interface to our BI stack mm -hmm. that we have there. The BI stack is what lets you to connect to all these various data sources, do the analytics on the top of that. So bot is just you. We kind of uh, rather than showing you a bunch of dashboards or reports that you need to run, we're simplifying the interface for you, and our stack is what powering the bot in the back end actually. But you're not solving the problem of heterogeneous data formats. You're, I mean, you're assuming that there is, is some standard interface, some st standard data format that some cleansing has gone on yeah, to um, make this all Exactly. That's the nature of the business is just right. You are dealing with multiple data sets in multiple yeah. different formats. You, there's no work here. Again, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's part of the data that you have to deal with. So what we are providing is really, as you as a business user, you don't want to deal with all the complexities and learning uh, your machine learning or how exactly you can come right? You want answers for your right. simple questions. And that's what the interface is solving from this. So what I'm hearing is an ability to do uh, ad hoc dashboard creation based on natural language. So yeah, so you can Processing. use yeah, the traditional way of BA, you can certainly use our platform to do that. Uh, you can go create a nice dashboards and all those things. But our main key differentiator compared to all the tools that are out there is the bot interface, which is really making it very easy for your end users to interact with it. One minute. Can you share the, the perfect customer like in detail? Like they have a database of yeah. sales and a database of, I don't know, what's the perfect customer that you would, you would sell this to? Sure, um, so most of the customers that we've been interacting with more of like uh, the SaaS sort of uh, solution providers. Uh, one of our customer, they help with the sales planning. Uh, when you have like millions of customers, how effectively you 
you assign targets to the salespeople, where they need to be located, etc. So they deal with a lot of uh, demographics data and internal planning data, and then all these kind of various data sets basically. So this kind of providing them to really interact in a natural way. So when you say like, a, hey, uh, what are the sales target for so and so person actually? So you might be really going against data from multiple sources and curating in a way so that you as a business end user can easily understand and make sense of that. How do you accommodate unstructured data? So uh, that, that, that's, uh, that there are multiple steps to the unstructured data, right? I mean, it's not like you just uh, take it and do that. I mean, again, what we are dealing mainly uh, here. What is the Sorry. So we right now integrate with more of the relational and non-relational databases. We don't really deal with the text or that kind of uh, data set. But right now, uh, we connect with these kind of data sources in the, in the native format that they support and then uh, extract the data. Great. Thank you, Suresh. Thank you. Our next uh, company presenting is Kitchenology. So please welcome Kitchenology. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Kitchology, I'll Kitchenology. Be Kitchenology. That's okay. I'll take the check. I read it right the first time. I know. You did myself. That's okay. All right. It happens all the time. The first time we got a paycheck, we got a payment from a customer. They wrote a check to Kitchenology, and I had to say, "Am I proud or am I stupid?" And it's like we cashed the check. Of course. And absolutely. 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 Very good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you for the opportunity. And there will be about six seconds before it gets displayed. Eight, I want my eight seconds. Ten. I'm arguing. There's an additional penalty for the EN. You should start talking about it while you get your. Sure, so we are a media analytics platform. Thank you for playing along. We are a media analytics platform for people with special diet. I'm, I'm here with uh, the best co founder in the world, Iris Sherman. Um, and uh, we started this uh, business uh, in 2013. So the, there is, uh, this platform is absolutely unique. It took us a long time to cook it, the pun is intended. Um, it is the first time that people with special diets uh, will have the ability to manage their diets, taking into account their likes and dislikes, and what they have in their pantries. So in the world where you're being told if you have a special diet, evidently I eat everything, as uh, this would show. Um, okay, that's... sorry about that. Here's your, your actual four minutes, and um, you had that extra time also because there's a formatting issue, but unfortunately we couldn't display the properly formatted slideshow. So, uh, Darn, Microsoft, yeah. darn. This is your... Uh, this is, this is a very nice picture of oh. spores growing on a yogurt. Oh, sorry, actually, this is coral. It's coral in Costa Rica. This is, this is a special diet we don't want to try. Okay. Uh, it's, yeah, sorry, one, one more minute here. It's just... So I open in uh, Vegas in three weeks, so I'm working, yeah. So this platform, um, there'll be a quiz on slide one. This platform really helps people with special diets uh, make better food decisions. And rather than taking a, you know, thinking of the world as, wow, I can eat all of this, and then being told no, 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 no. All right, finally. Sorry, now folks. Get, Here we now, go. Now we give them the ability to, um, cool. we give them the ability to make food choices that fit their goals. Um, this is a big business, and heretofore, uh, suppliers didn't really know how people were using the food. They know how you buy the food, they know the kind of interest you have, but they don't really know how you consume it. And often when you're making food decisions about the meal or preparing a shopping list, uh, brands don't have the ability to really interact with you. So this platform is a media analytics platform that does this. Uh, we are located in Maryland. It's okay, you can cross the bridge. Uh, and we're gaining more and more tractions and uh, are getting quite thrilled. Uh, this is one of the things we're the most proud of. We didn't know that our platform could be so important to retailers and it turns out that it is and that has opened new monetization path, okay? This is the team. In order to do something that deals with nutrition and food, you need great co-founders. I mean, a great co-founder, Iris, a good CMO. Charlie Bags uh, designed foods for, he's a chef, but designed foods for uh, brands. Uh, Luke is our CTO. Uh, Barbara Boyce is a nutritionist that has worked in private practice as well as in public uh, book companies, and we have a great lead on the community. Uh, she has organized 250 food allergy bloggers who are instrumental in getting embedded in the community. 
160 million people deal with special diets in the US. They consume half a trillion in food. They get a quarter trillion in specialized uh, uh, medicine. Um, and suppliers with their wellness providers, manufacturers, or retailers want to reach them. So what do we do is we transform recipes, and then we also transform shopping lists, in order to make your the recipe that you find on our platform or your important platform conform with your dietary goals. And we do that through extensive machine learning, a proper database, and we've patented, as uh, Steve Jobs once said, the crap out of it. <laughs> How do we make money? Two phases. We are in the blue phase, which means we have a consumer-facing website, we have a consumer-facing mobile app on the iPhone, um, we are growing the consumers, and we are now marketing our platform for both used to market products, provide offers, co-market and the like, as well as provide analytics. We capture everything that is going on when the user is modifying their shopping list and modifying their meals. And you can imagine the power that this does. Because I can learn a lot from your interactions and the way you are yourself modifying the recipe and keeping with it. Um, we are migrating slowly, maybe even not so slowly anymore, to a B2B market where we are being asked to co-market a platform, to white label a platform, or to provide it in the form of an API. Uh, retailers and wellness providers are definitely push us, pushing us in this direction. So since we start with B2C2B, to B, we've been at this for some time, and we're getting close to 300,000 monthly active users. And if it doesn't look, and mostly on the web, we're still are working to get more downloads of the apps. And if you compare it to other sites that are doing recipe, we're kind of the anti-recipe site, because we can take a recipe and morph it to 150 variations, we're doing quite well. On the traction side, um, it's a mix and match between um, retailers, uh, wellness providers. Uh, one interesting thing about being in DC is the USDA that spends a lot of our tax dollar promoting indirectly beef, avocado, walnuts, canned peach from California and the like, and these people have a lot of money. And we're very glad to put them because we can show how you can use beef more or how, <coughs> I'm talking to the Cattlemen Association, you can go from beef to pork and the like. With the financials, we with Sunday last year, Sunday this year, we turned up, we turn on the revenue making until the last moment because we wanted to be <coughs> absolutely embedded in the community and have the trust before throwing onto them uh, 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 advertising, publishing, and the likes. How do you make money? Uh, we'll get bought by someone, uh, maybe one of those, or maybe someone else. We've spoken to every one of these guys, uh, and these give you some comparables, and. Uh, we are raising money, and we're halfway through a million dollar raise. Uh, Iris and I have put a tremendous amount of skin and dollars into the game, and now I'm ready for your questions. Thank you. So you're raising around now a million dollar round. How much have you gotten already? Uh, half a million. Half a million and uh, 525,000. And uh, the last the last we thing we, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, this is not a public solicitation, blah, blah, blah. No, no you can't. Uh, you can't. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, how many page views do you have a month? Uh, page views we have each month, uh, we're going north of 550,000 now. Okay, so where's your revenue coming from? You doing? For the moment, we, uh, we try to do, uh, because we wanted to bundle uh, uh, sales uh, on the channels and sales on the app, kind of the direct, and uh, we realized that we should realize on that network. So we are now realizing on ad networks solely uh, on the website. On the mobile app, the model is different in the sense that we are selling private areas, which we call recipe channels, to brands. So you're saying click ads, you know, so what's your, what's your, your rate per thousand? Uh, the rate per thousand uh, varies. Uh, right now we're around, uh, last month, between 350 and 360. Can you tell us a little more what the product is? Okay, so the product is an app and a website. So it's either on your iPhone, um, so to the, to the consumer. And so um, you find, uh, you, in, you in, well, you'll import on the 1st of January, you find a recipe on our website, uh, you have entered profiles, and then we're gonna propose <laughs> modifications. And we're gonna take into account what we've learned through machine learning about your likes and dislikes, and what are the patterns of use. It turns out that while there are 300,000 SKUs of products in the US, and typically a supermarket has uh, 30,000, you are using between 200 and 300. So it's relatively straightforward to learn a lot about what you're doing. So when we make recommendation, there's a certain wow factor to say, maybe you should use this more because we think you are liking carrots or you're buying you know, 
cilantro on a regular basis. So um, do I have to keep track of what I buy and what I no, do through the app? No, no, no. Uh, this, has, this has been designed in a manner from, from the get-go into minimizing the amount of input that, that you have. The more data you give us, the better it is. We've architected a solution so that we can work with third party that are doing ordering and the like and suck the information in in order to do more profiling. In fact, one of our strongest patents is in that area. But we designed the system to learn through interactions what, what, what you do. When we reach a level where we'd like to have more confidence about what you are doing, we'll ask you explicitly to confirm what we've learned. Of course, we don't trust your answer because <laughs> anything to do with food, such as, I swear to God, I'm cutting up fat, you know, in fact, doesn't really work. And even if someone says, I'm trying to avoid gluten or I'm trying to go paleo, uh, we know that there are some exceptions. So our model is a, uh, a stochastic model, uh, but it learns pretty quickly what you have. And the nice thing about food, it is for all practical purposes, a weekly cycle. So you can learn very quickly when things happen. So when you say you learn what you have, based on the recipe you decide to use? Or what you search, how quickly you search the element. If you take a picture at the end and I count the number of people, I can figure it out. Are you cooking for yourself and others? If I know- It seems like you have to have some sort of input. It's not just like you search recipes and then you know what I'm eating. You, you, you have to enter, in, in the current version, you have to enter a profile of foods you're trying to avoid. We purposefully yeah. don't practice medicine. We do not practice medicine. No lawyers come after me. We do not <laughs> practice medicine. So we ask you, do you avoid cilantro? Do you avoid meat? Do you try to yeah. emphasize sugar or salt? We used to think sugar was important and one of our members of the board director had four heart attacks in a row, so now I guess you wanted ready salt on the roadmap. Um, the idea is we learn implicitly and when it is beneficial to us, or when there is a prince to an opportunity of this ragu from a company called Mitzvah to have a coupon, we say, do you really like tomato sauce to be prepared for you? That's an opportunity for interaction to sell you a coupon. We'll probably get $4 from it, even if the dollar is only 70 cents to you. And then we learn that under these circumstances, you like you know, a to, a, you know, tomato in, in, in the form of a sauce. And that allows us to learn. So what does your monthly growth rate look like right now? The monthly growth rate, uh, gross, gross, gross rate. Yeah, you know, the gross growth rate is not enough. So we're growing around 6% a month. And the, the, the thing that we're going through, we're going through an interesting event in our lifetime. Um, and I'm not talking about the election. Um, it's, uh, I had two. There was one. I was in Europe uh, last week, uh, just before Thanksgiving, to do stuff. I got tired of answering the question over and over again. We are being pulled quickly to try to white label our solution for wellness providers. And then the wellness angle, I mean, when you see companies such as, let's say, uh, uh, Philips or John Hopkins or um, Cone Health, which is a, a, a company in North Carolina, we are in this fork of the road. Are we a food plus tech? Are we a wellness plus tech, a wellness plus food tech? We know that we want to go because it's a lower cost of acquisition of a customer and it's a nicer valuation and then we're investor in the company so we want to save money. Then we want to want to a B2B model. But whether it's going to be a B2B that sells to the wellness sector or sells to the food sector remains to be seen. Free advice? Yes. Don't be an internet site trying to make money off advertising. Oh, right. Your ad <laughs> rates. So your ad rate. You're not, so I totally agree. This is where we want to go. You, that's where you gotta go. Or you gotta figure out how to be selling leads to hire. Uh, uh, we, 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 we totally The ad rate's just not high enough. It, it, uh, it, it is the beginning, we, uh, and I appreciate the feedback, and I'm glad you've got this knowledge, because you could add a lot of value. With oh, oh, you are, you are so good. Uh, uh, thank, thank you for helping. Uh, good, uh, the uh, warrant numbers. Do you have the warrant number for the bank? Yeah. Uh, but anyway, um, <laughs> the reason I spent the day before Thanksgiving in Amsterdam is because we were asked to white label an API. And the, the, the faster we can go there, the less I have to worry about the cost of acquisition, the churn is someone else's business. Churn is good for milk. Churn is not good if you try to acquire a company. Well, yes, so how many, unique, how many unique yeah. users do you have, and what is their frequency of, of interaction? The frequency of the interaction is not where we want it to be because we want to measure it solely on, on the app, and we have not had enough marketing dollars, which is why we need some marketing savvy person to help us. Uh, to download it. It's about uh, once every 10 days type of a deal. So it is not enough and satisfying enough. And we know that we have to have a higher engagement on the web app where we capture the return of this. And how many unique, unique users? Unique is about 75% uh, 70, uh, of the overall number of users are unique. Excellent. 25% well, return. Great. Well, join me in thanking Kitology. I'll take them all. I'll take money in the right now.
there are more seats up front here, so uh, if you want, there's a seat, in, actually a couple seats in the front row, some right here, so folks in the back, feel free to rest your legs if you'd like. <clears throat> I'd like to welcome up our next company, Shatsu, am I saying that correctly? Yes. Shatsu, excellent. Please join me in welcoming Shatsu. My name is Julian Wright. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Shotsu. We're a bulk product photography platform for online businesses. But first, let me tell you a story about Airbnb. First year of Airbnb being in business, they only made $200. Why? Because their images sucked. So what did they do? They went out and they hired professional photographers to reshoot the images on the platform. And when they did, guess what happened? Revenues went up. So in order to protect that huge revenue driver, they created an in-house photography department. When I read that, I said, whoa, there are tons of online companies and e-commerce platforms that rely on images uh, to drive revenue. And if that's the case, most of them, A, cannot afford to allocate uh, a human capital towards the in-house photography department, or they might not have the financial capital to have staff photographers. So when we figured that out, of course we wanted to test that hypothesis, so what did we do? We conducted a highly unscientific survey, and we went out and we spoke to uh, uh, platform owners and, and online businesses, and we said, look, here's a question. 20 seconds are on the clock. Think about how many uh, product photographers that you know. Guess what, came back zero. Hey, here's another 20 seconds on the clock. How many people do you know that smoke marijuana? 17 was the average. <laughs> All right, so that's a joke, but this isn't. <laughs> so here we go. So being that we, uh, being that we partner with high growth startups, there are a few things that we enjoy. One is zero cost of new customer acquisition. We also have zero cost to launch new markets. And when we do launch a new market, we have guaranteed revenue when we go into that market. We also enjoy 33% margins and Compared to other service platforms, Ubers of this, that, or the other, we are building a pretty substantial portfolio of IP because we also own the copyrights of all the images that are shot. And guess what? It costs us zero dollars for that. This is a look at the platform. Uh, I may not have mentioned Postmates. Uh, the food delivery app is our largest client. Um, what we did was spend about three months with them just kind of figuring out what the best flow would be to uh, get the data on what restaurants need to have food shot, uh, dispatching photographers, uploading images to the platform, allowing them to approve those images, and of course getting paid. This is a look at the dashboard, and I'm sorry, you know, we still use dashboards. Um, that, <laughs> that, uh, that Postmates sees in order to approve those things. Um, market adoption. So, with Postmates, we are in 27 markets, those stars representing markets, so as you can see, we like stars. Um, Rent Like a Champion, we've shot for them. They're on Shark Tank, Chris Saka and Mark Cuban are investors. We have a contract with Redfin. Uh, these are companies that we believe we can partner with, Amazon, Prime Express, uh, I mean, Prime, Google Express, Airbnb, Shopify, and we are in talks with uh, the final two. Uh, as we said, we are able to launch pretty quickly into markets. We can, on average, about five days launch a market, and we can also do multiple markets simultaneously. The market size is $9.9 .9 billion for photography services. We have virtually no competition. Any startup that says that they're doing or thinking about doing kind of what we're doing is probably a third or fourth pivot for them. So they're almost on their way out, uh, dying a slow death. And plans for funding. We're looking to raise $250,000, and that is so that we can go out and dominate that $9.9 .9 billion market. Once again, my name is Julian Wright. I'm the CEO of Shotzu, and I'm available at julian at shotzu.com. Thank you. And I'm open for questions. You've obviously done this before. <laughs> 
I've read a book about it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> your public speaking uh, skills are uh, the lies. You've done more than read a book, my man. So, do you say that Mark Cuban invested already? Oh, no, no, and uh, Rent Like a Champion, which is a company that we um, that we shop for. I see. Okay. So, you know, plants like this, are, you know, create an ecosystem. It's like Don Quixote, man. I mean, it's yeah. Somebody somebody wins. They win big. You know, if you'd come to me and said, "Hey, let's do an app to you know have people get cards in their taxis," right. like, <laughs> well, all right, you and whose army? Yeah. So. What, what's the what makes you think that the virality exists okay. for you to be able to make this uh, an, an Airbnb or Uber? Or sure. That's a hard one. So um, originally, the the grand idea was to basically be an Uber for photographers, right? Um, but like uh, Peter Thiel would say, we needed to find our parallel market, and what we found out was that would be a business to business model, and more specifically, a business to business model with other online entities because number one, nabbing one B2B customer has a network within it that's so massive. Um, I don't know if I mentioned when we grew to 27 markets with Postmates, we did that in under six weeks. So that was very quick, we had money there. It would take us forever if we had a VC model to do that. So we're kind of like in the Uber black phase right now and uh, mm -hmm. dealing, <laughs> thank you. Um, dealing with it as such, we're able to scale very rapidly. I mean, six months in 27 markets and making money. So what kind of money do you make per customer then? Uh, yeah, so basically, the we uh, $150 is the average, so we net $50 per shoot. Can you talk about how you launch a new market? And sure. what's the sure. actual process. Uh, there is a secret sauce to that, which I cannot divulge, but basically uh, we use a pretty interesting method where we drop a hook with some bait into the pool of photographers and they jump into the boat. 70 probably will give us a response within an hour or two, but it's between online forums, things of that nature that we've identified where we can get people very quickly. <laughs> so you you outsource all the photography to any new market, and then yes. you are the it's the legion for local photography. That's exactly what it is. Exactly. Yeah. And we vet, especially for someone like Postmates, we have to vet those photographers. Part of that three month um, period of time that we spent with Postmates was developing <laughs> what you what you call a style sheet or you know, what they want. It's about an eight, eight page document that tells a photographer everything about the look that needs to be achieved. So once we work on that, we can get that out to those guys and they're professionals, they're freelancers. That's the cool thing about this market is we're not dealing with amateurs. We're dealing with people who make their money as freelance photographers. So there's not a lot of hand holding. We get them that, they shoot the product, they get it back to us and you know, they get paid. So can you tell us about your team? Who's uh, working on this? Yes, it's a two-man team. It's myself and my CTO, Mecca Ezekwa. Uh, he is a BS, and he has his master's in computer science from <coughs> Carnegie Mellon. Uh, he currently works for Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. Oh, so he's really dumb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The worst guy ever. <laughs> worst guy ever. <laughs> guy ever. Carnegie Mellon and Hopkins. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So the two of us were able to grow this company very quickly, one, because of the brilliant software uh, that he was able to build, and two, because I thought very deeply about how do we get this thing going and scale it up quickly. So with Postmates, what type of uh, recurring plan do they have with you? Is it a per shot basis? Is it a, as many pictures or as many different, typically, how, how do you set up your actual business model? Yeah, typically what, what they do is they have, um, on their end, they have a part of their site where they send an invitation out to their food merchants to sign up for photography. It started out with their top you know, producers. And then those people sign up, they send us that data, it goes into our back end, and it automatically spits out uh, an email to the photographers in that area. Uh, Postmates, we are, you know, we're their, you know, their photography services uh, uh, vendor. So is it a per, like the, Actual restaurant or whoever it is. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, it's one hundred fifty dollars per restaurant. So they send us direct a, to the restaurant, not no, no, Postmates. No. Postmates pays us directly. Got it. So they didn't charge back the no, restaurant. No, it's free to the restaurant. 
And it's the same, a similar model for Airbnb. They send out people as gratis to the uh, to the person because they understand that this drives yeah. revenue. So they 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 put the bill for that. Yeah, so which is also awesome because we don't have to pay for money. So you would sell the Airbnb. <laughs> Of course. So, we, can you talk about that sales process? How are you going to How are you going to okay, sell so, and close so, Airbnb? Okay. So, how would we close with Airbnb? Yeah. All right. Interesting. Um, and they would fall under the B to B to C model here. So, Airbnb. Uh, I actually happen to know the number eleven hire at Airbnb. He found us on another startup that we were working on, and we developed an awesome relationship. So, we've been able to talk this out and. One interesting fact that I found was that Airbnb does not, uh, they, they do the initial photography work gratis, but they will not do a follow-up. So if you think about how long Airbnb has been around, a lot of the hosts have updated their you know, units or their properties and they want new photographs. So then we would be that preferred partner that they would recommend um, to come out and shoot that stuff. Do you have a specific focus in terms of market? I mean, it sounds like startups, but it, yeah. is there anything limiting you from becoming just on-demand photography? Uh, there's nothing limiting us. The thing is that it costs us no money to advertise. It costs us no money to, to get a new client because it's just emails and phone calls. So for us, it would be best to dominate this market now, especially because I heard you ask a question of someone else who's that perfect customer for us. Um, when you have a startup that is a flush with cash, that has been told by Y Combinator and every y, uh, VC that they need to grow rapidly, they need us, and they're not thinking about it, so they want us to get out there and do that. So, so is that 9.9 .9 billion all startups? No, that 9.9 .9 billion is just photography services, period. So everything from your wedding to your child's first birthday. How big can you get a startup alone? Uh, I believe that, well, 27% of that mark, well, I'll give you a point. Airbnb has 2 million uh, 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 listings plus right now. So that 2 million listings plus is $30 million in revenue. I mean, I'm sorry, $300 million in revenue potentially if we shot all of those. And that's just one company. So just having any small percentage of that is awesome. Um, getting in with these other companies like a Postmates and some of the other ones that are starting and we continue to grow with them, we only get that bigger, as, uh, you know, as big as they can continue to get. Great, thank you, that's time. Thank you. Thank you. The next company is SmartSense. Please welcome SmartSense. Smart Sense, and uh, what we are is a good old-fashioned technology company. We have real-life hardware. Um, we build systems, um, and uh, we're we're based upon some technology that we acquired from the United States Navy. Uh, most of you have seen the Hunt for Red October. Well, that long-distance sonar capability is the fundamental sensing platform that our technology is based on. And what we've done with that technology is we've adapted it to the commercial marketplace. And we really have worked on a couple of things, but in the last 18 months, we've begun to focus in two areas which we're delivering product today. One is drone detection, and the second is seismic detection, specifically tunnel detection. And uh, our, our advantage technically in those areas is that we can detect things at far greater distances than any other commercially available product, and we can do it with much higher resolution, which means we can identify much more easily and effectively what we're listening to. And the second advantage we have is a massive price performance advantage, primarily because our cost basis, in contrast to any comparable technology, is very, very low. Um, today's market in the drone detection area is a very confused and uncertain market. It's still evolving. It will continue to evolve. And uh, what we bring to it is the capacity in that market to have a neat capability in the acoustic detection piece of it, which is because this is a multiple sensor market. The systems are going to have to include visual, radar, and acoustics. And we have the acoustics piece, and we're working 
right now in in uh, in with with one of the leading small aperture radar people to to make a truly good effective overall system. But we have a good uh, entry level acoustic system. This is our system today. Um, as you can see, it's hardware. Uh, it, uh, we detect signals, we analyze them, we figure out what they are, where they are, and we swivel the camera so that our operator can look at it. We're going to automate a lot of that and we're going to improve the performance over the next couple of years. When you look at the drone detection world, it's going to be a world that evolves. We're at the infancy of this. It's not clear where everything is going to go, but you know some basics. Number one, the first critical market is going to be national defense, DOD. Number two, the second critical market is going to be critical infrastructure protection, driven in, in key part by uh, regulation. And then finally, you're going to have a drone traffic management uh, area, which is going to be a very considerable market. In the seismic area, we simply have the world's best mousetrap. <laughs> we've, we've done head-on-head -head comparisons. The Army Corps ran a test in Utah at Doug Wade, um, where basically our performance profile is an order of man magnitude 10 times better in terms of detection range, two orders of magnitude 100 times better in terms of signal resolution. However, at the same time, this is a complicated market. And on top of our detection and signal capability, there are all sorts of layers of software that have to go for specific applications. And what we, we've been doing is we're teaming with people or we're providing the just the detection part of a system. Um, and so far, we're, we're having some success. Um, our story, very simple. Uh, we took some Navy technology, we adapted it, and we experimented with a couple of, of, of areas of application, and we're focused today on drones and, and on that. Uh, Great, thank you. That is now seven minutes of Q&A. So, so this is a tech transfer out of uh, NRL. Do yeah. you have the, uh, the, the, they retain government purpose rights, or can you sell this back to government? We can sell it to the government. So, I heard a rumor that there's gonna be some wall built someplace <laughs> nearby. Uh, are you talking with DHS yet? And if you're not. We, we, we not only talk with DHS, the Border Patrol yeah. uh, ranks us as the best solution for the acoustic protection piece of what they're gonna to try to do. Yeah, I mean, I'm, so I'm doing a lot but of- We're talking about DHS, which is oh, the I, world's I, most I, dysfunctional organization. Yeah, I'm not gonna come over there. Uh, we have no near term thoughts that DHS is a major customer in the, in the 12 day chemo time. You mean to tell me that you're an entrepreneur and can't do business with the federal government because it's hard? I, I, I get that. That's what I've been doing with Flip Tandem and Aside. The tragedy, I guess, is, is that uh, I'm doing a lot of stuff with national security in my day job. And you, this is exactly a technology. I mean, you know this. So I guess your challenge is, and you're looking for private investors to provide you with some money to keep love alive while these knuckleheads figure out a get you in a program as a record, because the White House had the, I mean, I, I, I know you've talked with a lot of the same people I've talked with. Your biggest problem is they can't figure out how to get you in a program. Is that what's going on? Well, actually, we're, we're being slotted into a China Lake program right now. Okay. We just finished the state of work, and then we're, we're being, we've just become the subcontractor on the big convoy detection program that they, the, the Office of Secretary of Defense is. So somebody's already told you that if you can manage to stick with this a little while longer, you'll never want to raise any money from any investor because you won't have to. Yeah, but our problem is, is very simple. As we look out to next year, we just did this exercise over the last couple of days. As we look out to next year, we're probably going to have revenues that would suggest on a monthly or, or a quarterly basis that, hey, you don't need to raise any money. The problem is once you begin to break it down and look at it week by week, uh, it's it's an uneven cash flow. So we need some money to support cash flow. And we also need some money to invest in the industrial side of this. We have some opportunities, particularly with electric utilities and water utilities and so forth, to become a platform that they use for their drone detection and so forth that they're being required by regulation to adopt. And the, the, the difficulty with those customers is they're used to a world in which somebody comes at, puts in a system for you know, a couple of months, they test it, if it works fine, then it goes into 200 substations. And 
we actually have that opportunity, that specific kind of opportunity with an electric utility, and we need to be able to fund that kind of project. So, so I, I think I know where this technology came from, but just confirm for me that basically you're able to filter out all the extraneous noise, you're able to you know, understand the particular signature of different types of drones, <coughs> like screws them, and are you also able to provide you know, basically 3D rendering? Or is it, is it just sort of directional? At, at this point, we're getting the information for the mesh, but we, we, we don't do that yet. We'll, we'll, we'll be there 18, 24 months, but we're not there yet. So is this, is this passive sonar, or what, what is it that we're looking at? Uh, it, it's, it's passive acoustic detection. Passive acoustic detection. Okay. And it came out of sonar as the original. Okay. And, and you don't have the data fusion piece down yet? Okay. What are there are there applications for this in non-federal, non-regulated industries? Non-federal, absolutely. And what, are, um, what would they be? Well, one one of the key carry areas is, uh, for example, we've had some discussions with one of the major telecommunications carriers about the protection of cell sites. They want to know whether cell sites are being surveilled. They want to know what is surveilling the cell site. Talk to any other governments, any foreign governments? Yeah, Israel. Yeah. Yeah, they got a big problem here. We we have a, a <laughs> memorandum of understanding with the major Israeli defense contractor. Yeah. Okay. And the, my it may my past that does direct business in Israel. We want a partner to handle Israel. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's too hard. Well, life's too, too short. Can you talk a little bit more about the background of the team, um, yeah, federal versus the, commercial, prior entrepreneurial experience? Um, I, I've been a serial entrepreneur, and Dr. Vakas is our chief scientist who spent a 40-year career at, at the Naval Research Laboratories, and is the guy who led the team that invented our underlying technology. Then we've got uh, a couple of key senior engineers who are strong backgrounds in acoustics and in, in, in radio uh, physics, um, which is a key element of what we do. Um, so we've got a lot of technical experience. Uh, Dave uh, Wells, who's here, uh, Vice President of Engineering, has a tremendous amount of experience in taking new systems and new businesses and growing them. Uh, he was the CTO at Talk America, if you remember that, uh, a few years ago. And Dave and I have worked on and on together. Our, our senior management team probably averages 60 years old, um, so we're very senior. Uh, we're still older. But there's, there's a great deal of experience. And then we've got a very good uh, board and advisory board. Um, and of people who give us access to the kind of customers that we need to be talking to. And also to the kind of channels that we're going to need to sell through. Because if this is initially going to be a product system sale, and it's going to turn into a service business. One more minute. Oh my God, no question. We can open it up to the one more. I'd like to hear more about the last part, but go ahead, John. No, that's, go ahead. I just, I, I just gotta tell you, I, I, I'm listening and just free advice for the day. Um, you probably need to figure out, this, this just, right now, I don't think you can find an investor who would see enough of a private opportunity and a private company. This is just, this, my, my dream, yeah. Mike. Sorry. Well, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm just. I, I'm just. You're a classic case of everything that's right and wrong with the federal government and how it deals with the innovators. And I had a. And you probably know that, but I sit in meetings with the federal government. We need to get innovators. We need to get innovators. And here you freaking are, right? <laughs> here you freaking are. Uh, so I, I'd like to have a sidebar with you just about some of the stuff. But but. I really suggest that your path to greatness is there. Uh, if you can just get one of these things over the, over the line. And then the lumpiness of your revenue, once you have it in, you know, there are, there are companies that will basically lend against, you know, they're factoring, but their companies will lend against the government contract once you, have the, once you have the PO. So you can smooth your, you can levelize your, your cash flow if you have a PO in hand. They'll lend against it without taking uh, uh, everything from you. And if you need a recommendation for that, I have a company that I know for that too. Great, thank, thank you for the advice, Jonathan, and thank you, Smart Sense.
our last company presenting tonight is a very exciting company that some of you may have used. It's a B2C, which is uh, somewhat of a rarity in the area. Uh, Spotluck, which I have on my phone. I've been using it for about a year. Of all things, Spotluck and Canvas, the founding member of Refraction, were in a uh, competition earlier this year. And we got to the, the final uh, four, and then we, we made it on to the, the final round, and, and Spotluck took the prize for the DC Techs. Um, I, I can't remember the exact title, but it's a, it was a great award. And uh, we, we're, we're still a little bit resentful. No, but we, we wish Spotluck all the best. Uh, clearly, that they're here tonight. And would you please welcome Cherian from Spotluck. How's everybody doing? It was uh, DC Tech Man that's most valuable company in the next Sorry. five years. And, uh, yeah, we were a Cinderella story. But um, we're excited to be here, excited to be part of the DC, Maryland, Virginia tech community. Um, and excited to share a little bit about who we are, what we do, and why we do it. Um, so, Cherry Thomas, co founder and CEO of Spotluck, um, the reason we started this company is I felt that prices in a restaurant on a Tuesday at 2 p.m. when it's raining shouldn't be the same as prices in a restaurant on a Friday night at 6 when it's beautiful out. And restaurants agree to the tune of nearly 1,000 paying restaurant clients all the way up from Maryland, D.C., Virginia, Baltimore, Philly, New Jersey, and now we're about to launch New York City, arguably the largest dining destination in the world. Um, so what we set out to do was to bring yield management to the restaurant space. Uh, if you look at all the great companies out there, they're all constantly changing their prices to manage their yield and maximize their profits. Uh, Amazon's changing prices over 2.5 million times a day, and airline seats changing around 200 times a day. The airlines nailed it, right? They realized if I charge $400 for every seat, I'm never gonna fill this plane. They still have gate fees, still have the captain, co-captain, peanuts were paid for. So the plane's taken off, they try to fill that seat at varying prices. That's what we aim to do in the restaurant space. So as I demo the app, please keep that in mind. Uh, how do we do that? We created some software that fluctuates prices in restaurants through discounts. Uh, based on day, time, weather, ratings, distance, all factors that affect restaurant occupancy. And so this is all great and fine and dandy. You can change your prices every second, every minute, but if no one knows about it, it doesn't matter. Um, so we've had some great success by solving a recurring problem. So we solve a smart problem, which is why restaurants love us, and we solve a recurring problem, which is why consumers love it. And John, you mentioned you know, things that are working in the DC area. Uh, this is a heat map of where everybody has opened up Spotluck and taken a spin since inception. We don't do any marketing outside of Maryland, DC, Virginia, mm -hmm. Philly, and now uh, Baltimore. But yet a friend is telling a friend that's telling a friend that's telling a friend that's telling a friend. Um, and so we have something here it's that consumers like. Yeah. Um, so we have something, and, and companies, companies spend lots of money to try to get their brand out there. We're fueling one side of the platform, right, without that consumer acquisition cost. And so, you know, we've got a good foundation, but as sexy as this is, I gotta get some freaking restaurants in Florida, because uh, I don't have restaurants there and people are opening the app. And so I wanted to demo the app real quick and a couple milestones, um, and just to show you why we solve a recurring problem. Um, Spotlight is all about food, fun, and local, right? It is really hard to figure out where to eat when you're in Georgetown, Arlington, Clarendon, Falls Church, all these areas, right? Um, but you certainly know you want local. You don't go into Georgetown and say, where's, you know, uh, Chili's? You can say, where do the locals eat around here? <laughs> And so the main features of the app, you have hubs, so you can pick what neighborhood you're in. Let's just say we're in Chinatown, which is me. Uh, if we're in Chinatown, you know, instead of arguing, which everybody does it, husbands, wife, coworkers, roommates, right? This is where we solve that recurring problem. You get one spin per day, and totally at random, it's gonna pick a restaurant for you, all right? So that's where we solve this ability to get in front of everyone and anyone. Clearly, people in Florida are talking about how we solve this problem. So what you'll notice is what you land on is random, but the discount is not. That's using our software. The software. That discount is higher on Mondays, lower on Fridays. If it's raining, the discount goes up. You can see there's a weather bonus now because it's cruddy outside. Uh, but keep in mind, we're a marketing company on the front end, big time data company on the back end. Uh, so we can track what people do with their fingers and their bellies in a hyper-local setting. The other great thing about Spotluck is if you go into that area, not only is the discount change based on day and weather, but also by time. Um, so right now it's eight o'clock, we get 20%. In the essence of time, I do want to show you guys the other side of the platform, which is what the restaurants see. They have a merchant app. They can see who's in their restaurant, reviews. We just recently made all the reviews public. They can respond to them now as well. 
Um, they could upload photos, but the really neat part is the analytics side. We understand they're not data scientists, but we can tell them how popular they are. Uh, we can tell them how many diners we brought. We can tell them the average discount of all those diners, the average age of those diners, the missed opportunities, and a heat map of where all those diners are coming from. So we know they're not data scientists, but we know that they love GPS verified reviews, which is what we provide. You have to be in the restaurant to leave a review. And they love knowing where the hell their customers are coming from. So we make it digestible, uh, because I agree, dashboards are just crazy, right? Di death to dashboards, but you know what? Know your stakeholder, know your market, make it digestible. They like seeing, this is real data, where we brought diners from. Anywhere that's green is where we brought some, but or two unique diners or more. So our pull is not only above the restaurant, but also around, and we create recurring transactions. Um, and the gamification makes it viral, and the spin, as much as it's fun and sexy for consumers, it's really there to protect the restaurants. It prevents cannibalization from occurring, which is what the other companies, great companies, Groupon, New York Social, all these companies, they failed to, to, to prevent, right? This is the new era. Um, restaurants are finally coming out saying, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, okay, I got burned, right? I'm, I'm out of the woods now, I'm willing to do some sort of marketing, we're there where the puck is going, with a product ready to go that's smart, protects their brand, protects their bottom line, uh, and make sure that they're, they're profitable. And this is part of Q&A, so. Sorry. No yeah. <laughs> so that's the, uh, the back of the book, so. Can you share some uh, metrics? How many users, yeah. what does the user growth look like right now? Sure, so um, right now um, we've got uh, around 150,000 users on the platform. We've got nearly 1,000 restaurants paying customers. On the other side of the platform, we're averaging around 100,000 spins on the month, or, or spins on the app every month. And we're converting that into over 30,000 diners actually going into a restaurant, taking out their phone and walking. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so from a user perspective, the, those are 30 customers per restaurant. Yeah, on so average per month. Yep, yeah, mathematically, if we don't bum rush, um, you know, 50 people in a the restaurant, they don't want that. Yeah, they just want every table count. So give me, a, give me good business every day. So we bring in a table or two every day to all of our restaurants. Some of them are superstars who bring in a lot more. Um, but uh, you know, to, to answer your question, you know, we do nothing and we get 500 new users a day um, just by doing by our whole team going back. What about uh, retention? How often do people come back and spin again? Yeah, sure. So that's key. That's all we focus on right now. So what we we've broken it down and basically our users, since we're onboarding so many new users a month, around 15,000, we have a lot of new users. But around 40% every month is a returning user from the previous. So we're getting people to use the app month over month, and our growth of usage on the month, uh, on the app is 20% every month. <laughs> I'm actually going out and using the app. I can't get someone in Florida to use the app. Yeah. I can just get them to spin. I don't really want them to know about it. I've done no media there or anything like that. They're just using it, right? Um, and then from the restaurant standpoint, one of the one of the exciting parts is that uh, we need to figure out how to scale this puppy. and. Uh, you know, we learned a lot of lessons in DC and we put it on freaking steroids in our new market. So all of our new markets uh, outperform uh, the, the previous. So for example, one of our go-to market strategies now is instead of doing what we used to do, sneak into buildings, put in flyers here and there, pretend to smoke a cigarette, you take the fourth floor, I'll take the third, all that crap, that's not scalable. Um, our restaurants now are our consumer acquisition arm. So we launched Baltimore recently, 30 days we were on the ground, we signed 75 restaurants, and now it's about 105. Every restaurant is marketing spotlight to their guests. So when I sign restaurants, they get me users, so they balance the two-sided marketplace uh, to make sure that it's you know not you know 100 restaurants with eight users or a thousand users or 100,000 users with eight restaurants. So when a person spins in say Florida where you don't have restaurants already set up, what happens? Um, we right now it defaults to to show them how the app well, like how the app would function, so it takes them to Georgetown. I feel like Georgetown is looking good. Uh, I, I went to Georgetown did my second master's there, so I figured, you know, I'd give a love, a little love to the community there. It's a short commute. Yeah, exactly. But um, but yeah, so it is a challenge, right? If it was easy, everybody would do it. But we have some new UI features that actually eliminate that. So right now we have enough restaurants where we can spin by cuisine versus spin by neighborhood. Um, we can't do that when you have 28 restaurants. You could do that when you have a thousand. And so those users actually will input how many miles they're willing to travel before they actually get into the app. Um, so it's again getting that info to give the consumer experience something that you you really want. So how does Yelp and OpenTable feel about you? How much they hate you, or uh, 
Well, well, they try to add some functionality and just crush you as soon as you prove this works. Well, there's reasons that they can't, right? And so uh, they're all great companies, um, you know, but they're not merchant centric, right? Groupon, great company, fastest company to hit a billion dollars in sales, offered six billion by Google. I'm not going to hate on them, but I am going to say you're not a merchant. Should have sold. Yeah, should have sold, and you're not a merchant centric product, right? We are merchant centric. Restaurants, right? We have a 4% attrition rate on our restaurants. So not only do we sign them on, they stay, and the fact that they're marketing our app to their guests, we clearly are providing value to them. So the Yelps, we're a key differentiator with Yelp because mm -hmm. we provide GPS verified reviews versus just, I'm had a bad Tuesday, I'm taking it out on these cheese fries. So why aren't you doing the self-serve thing? Why aren't you using software to do your, your restaurant acquisition? I mean, yeah, we, we are, we, we kind of try everything once, but uh, the merchant acquisition cost is really low. I mean, we've, we've nailed it down to $250 per restaurant. We can recoup that cost pretty quickly uh, with the number of diners that we're bringing in. And so, uh, and it also, Jonathan, it's the hospitality industry, right? I mean, good luck getting a restaurant owner to sit down and watch your webinar. Uh, they all, you know, they, they don't have time for that. And it is a service industry. Uh, but if my if my attrition rate wasn't four percent, I'd be concerned. But the fact that I can take time to sign them, you know what I'm getting at. I mean, ultimately, this is an ecosystem play. It's going to grow really fast, or someone's going to take it from you. And uh, I just, I just think to myself. What a wonderful world. No, I think to myself, <laughs> um, how, how could I make this as self-serving as, uh, as self -serve as somebody setting up their own, you know, the well, website and webs or, or whatever? Well, because if you could do that, well, when, we, have when, we, when we first started, um, it used to be, hi, my name's Charon, this is my wife, Katie, this is my dog, Osito, please put faith and trust in me and myself to come. How the dog do as a sales? He was amazing. He's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> but now we actually, restaurants sign themselves up. We have an online, right? So once we launch a city, we launched Baltimore, the suburbs call us. Philip Seafood signed themselves up, right? They're like, how do we get on this app? And so, um, you know, right now it's a little bit different. Once you have users and once you have restaurants, the restaurants come. Um, but you have to get that base. So we're launching New York City with 250 restaurants. For two months, they'll all be marketing us. We have 120 under contract now. We'll launch that live in February. And after New York City, that's when we turn on the national expansion on Uber. Uber sends a, a, a radio ad directed to merchants, or excuse me, directed to drivers, but it's good for the consumers, which we can also, also do as well. So I'm sure a lot of you guys know Rick Fleischer from uh, Urgently. And when Rick was starting with the business early on, he he wanted to solve the problem of, of radiators exploding in houses and you know, because his, his basement got washed out. But his problem was two-sided market, how did he create density? And you know, his aha moment was finding this aggregator of, of tow trucks, which is where he saw the problem. Yeah. Is there an aggregator of, of restaurants you know, that you could partner with that would really, that where you could basically buy access to a mailing list? There are. Um, we try to protect our brand right now in its infancy. We want the consumer experience to be great. So if we go around and just aggregate restaurants, you land on a cruddy restaurant, you don't have a good experience, you never return to the app, and you mess up my retention numbers. Mm -hmm. But if you bet the process, at least in the beginning, and you make sure that every consumer is having an incredible time, well then, eventually you could turn on the spigots, uh, both on monetization and also on onboarding restaurants. But um, you know, we look at things on just Hey, look, we took two years. We had to figure out how to get restaurants on board. We nailed it. We signed 260 restaurants in the past 60 days. We had to figure out how to get users. Well, we feel we've nailed it because our restaurants are getting us users. Now we got to really figure out how to you know, engage, retain, and, and then hit the, the big monetization. We plan to integrate with POS. The reason we're raising money now is one, make sure our New York launch is bazooka, uh, and two, make sure we integrate with POS. I'm bringing in 30,000 plus diners. I'm only seeing thirty thousand dollars. I want a percentage of that bill. Okay, and everyone else takes a. One last question. One last question. Yeah, so, right. so, so you're starting to get inbounds. How sure. do you bet? Pardon? I could. You, you bet inbounds on the restaurants? Uh, we do. Yeah. So first by proximity because of the UI of the app. So if a restaurant in Boonesboro calls us, we just can't work with you. So we put you in a, a pipeline. Uh, but if it is in the proximity of where our hubs are, then we do onboard them. All of our restaurants have over three and a half stars on Yelp. So we subjectively do look at that. Um, but that's in, internally. Um, and then we also let the data decide, right? We're generating user-generated GPS verified reviews. So we know if that's a cruddy restaurant, very accurately. If, if three people go in that restaurant and say that, that was the worst grilled cheese, whatever, worst chili I've ever had in my entire life. I saw fruit flies everywhere. If I get three of those, you're off. We have the first right, we have the right to do that. So I let data decide as opposed to being the bouncer, um, you know, and saying you can come in, you can. It's, it looks like data decide. And do you do you check the local button? 
that's, that's something that we do that. All of our restaurants are local or locally owned. Um, we don't allow any corporate chains. Uh, call it an executive decision, but I just really feel that people don't want to spin and land on McDonald's. Um, and we've turned down some corporate chains, um, but we'll figure it out. We'll figure out a nice way to, to incorporate them in time, but just not for Cheering had the least amount of time to prepare for this. Basically 24 hours, he knew the format, so gave him a little extra time. But thank you so much, yeah. Cheering. It was awesome. Yeah. Thank you all again for coming tonight. Um, I hope you learned something from the angels. And uh, you know, this is this is not quite Shark Tank. We don't have a one-hour pitch that we cut down to five minutes, um, and somebody makes a, an investment that may or may not uh, come through. In fact, if if some of you were here over the summer, we had an event where the number one bid on Shark Tank of all time um, was a company called uh, Swarkit, and ultimately that that. Episode aired, they had the, the highest bid of all time, it was a million and a half dollars, and then it fell through right after the, the episode aired. So what we're trying to do here is not Shark Tank, we're not trying to make an unreasonable expectation that somebody's gonna invest right away, but we are trying to build these relationships and that's sort of what we're all about at Refraction. So if you're interested in getting connected, thank you, Andrew, uh, please <laughs> grab one of our cards. They're uh, on the tables at the front. And uh, yeah, just thank you all so much for coming. There's plenty of beer, wine, and cider, so uh, I think there's probably some food too. Look forward to talking with you after. Thank you again. Thank you.